Hi, and welcome to our Friday webinar. Um, today we are with Dr. Lamb and Arroyo. I think Arroyo is back there. Hello, Arroyo, if you are. There we go. <laughs> um, so it's a great episode coming up of Vet Insider with Dr. Lamb. Um, and today, uh, Dr. Lamb is going to take us on a road trip, so to speak. Um, she's going to give us the the uh, the down low on what went down at Ex ExoticsCon uh, 2021. Is that, is that what we're calling it? Ex yep. ExoticsCon 2021. ExoticsCon 2021. There we go. That is where all your vets um, who treat the, the non-traditional, I guess, cat and dog, the non-cat and dog vets, they all gather once a year at this awesome event. And um, Dr. Lamb is going to uh, give us a, a rundown on what, what, what happened this year at this year's event. It's always an exciting and fun, um, I'm sure, endeavor for all the vets to attend. I, I've been there a couple times, and it is awesome. So um, let's see. Let's give the people a little bit of time to log on. Dr. Lamb, why they do that? Um, question for you is is it is when you leave to, when you go out of town for a conference like this is there a lot of planning involved on your end as far as your um, avian clients go <laughs> oh for like the clients that are still behind well i mean of course there is some planning that's going on because um since we're in all exotics hospital so in in many hospitals that are dog cat or a mix of dog, cat, large animal, what have you, um, you know, different vets will leave at different times to go to different conferences because there's conferences for veterinary stuff all over the country, all over the world happening all the time. And so usually in most practices, people will have, you know, one person who wants to go to a conference um, and, but, you know, nobody else wants to go to that conference. Problem with Ellen All Exotics Hospital is that all of us want to go to Exotics Con because it's our biggest conference. And though there's a couple of little ones here and there, um, there's not as many. There's way more dog, cat, horse, large animal conferences that are happening all the time. So we all often have to go, which does mean there is has to be a little bit of planning um, to figure out who's going to go what days so that we're covering, you know, the hospital and making sure that nobody is, um, that, that the hospital is not totally empty. Um, so yes, yeah. it does take a bit of planning, but we also, you will often send out like a, a reminder or something like that on our Facebook to say like, hey, a, a lot of our doctors are going to this conference. Um, we may not have um, as many appointment slots open. Um, so, you know, be patient. We'll be back. It's really important that we go to these things so that we can learn and bring back a lot of good information for your pets. Yes, that's good. That's good. Good, good thing you guys are uh, excited about going there as much as uh as we like to know what you guys learn from when you go there. So um, just a reminder that if you have a question, we'll see if we can get to some questions at the end. And if you do have a question for Dr. Lamb to use the Q&A button. Um, and with that said, Dr. Lamb, I think I'm gonna hand it off to you and um, let's see what uh, the who, what, when, and where of this event. All right, I am gonna go ahead and share my screen. So I'm gonna get this PowerPoint up here for you guys because I got some pictures for you. And let's get this. All right. So um, now every year when the conference is happening for Exotics Con, because it is the biggest conference that is happening for exotics. Um, it does change locations every year. There are some conferences that are in the same city at the same hotel or convention center um, year after year, but for Exotics Con, they do move it all over the U.S. Um, there is another large exotics conference that occurs uh, overseas once a year as well. That's the ICE conference. I haven't gotten to attend that. I, I've known a few people who have gotten to attend, but I myself haven't gotten to go to that one yet. Um, I've only been able to go to the exotics conference. And so that they don't make it so that, you know, it's unfair to exotics practitioners um, as far as traveling and, and everything goes, making it easier for some and not so easy for others. They move it all over the place. So it's kind of fun because you're not only going to learn all these new interesting things and, and get to talk with your colleagues and brainstorm and talk about your cases that are maybe a little more difficult that you need some more help on, um, but you also get to do a little bit of traveling. So this year it was in Nashville. Um, so this was the hotel where we were. We were at the Renaissance Hotel, um, downtown Nashville. Usually they're trying to put these conferences in 
someplace that number one is easy to get to where there's a major airport close by so people can easily fly in and out and not have to travel um, to too remote of a location and then um, also trying to make it somewhat fun so that the little bit of time that you have outside of the conference like at the end of the day you know maybe you can go see a little bit of the city um, maybe go to a new restaurant or something like that but I will say that um, the conference is are definitely jam packed with a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff going on. So sometimes the ability to get around uh, and see the city where the conference is, isn't always um, as uh, easy as one might think just because you're so busy, um, but that's, that's okay. You know, we're really going to these things because we are learning about our uh, exotic pets, our patients, um, learning the new things that others have discovered, um, whether it be new medications or new procedures, techniques, or even just discussing ideas about things that, you know, maybe we once thought a particular way about something and, hey, maybe we need to like reconsider this and consider, um, you know, a different angle that we could take on dealing with certain problems. So really because it is focused so much on learning and education, kind of okay that there's not a huge amount of time. Um, and today to, to talk with you guys, I had to bring my little like book um, <laughs> that has my schedule of everything that I did during ZotusCon because this year I had so much stuff going on. I literally had to keep a little schedule to make sure that I was at the right place at the right time. Um, because you know, you have these lectures that are going on. Uh, usually the lectures are going on for like three to four days um, of like morning to evening time lectures. And some of the lectures are gonna be um, like an hour long. Sometimes they're like two to four hours long, even the master classes can be up to like four hours long. But then there's also um, short lectures. So when people are giving just like case reports and things like that, though there are sometimes only 15 minutes lectures that are given. And so uh, you'll get this schedule when you first get to the hotel, you get in, you register, um, and then you look at the schedule to see all the different talks that are happening. And they'll usually give you the schedule beforehand too, so you can do a little bit of planning. Um, but a lot of people will go through those schedules and, and go, okay, I wanna go to this talk and this talk, and oh, I really need to see this. And sometimes you have to pick and choose because the other thing about Exotics Con is, I know we've talked about it before, but when, when we think about exotics, there's many, many different species that fall into the exotics category, but generally there's like three big groups, avian, small mammal, and then reptile and amphibian gets lumped into one. Um, those are the three big groups and they all come together. And so, because most people who are seeing a bird are also probably seeing a tortoise and most people who are seeing a ferret are probably also seeing, you know, a chicken or what have you. Um, so, so we, you have to sometimes when you, when you get these uh, schedules, um, you're seeing these three different groups, the avian group, the small mammal group, the reptile amphibian group, and you have to choose which lecture you want to go to. And so sometimes people get a little sad because sometimes there's really good competing lectures going on at the same time. And you got to go, ooh, which one do I want to go see more? Um, now, the good thing is, is that you also get um conference proceedings so you'll get like a little like paragraph or a page about whatever it is this individual is talking about so it's nice that you have that material to reference back to but what's funny is a lot of times people will split things up um as if you're going with friends and things where one person goes okay i'm going to go look at you know, go watch this lecture you go watch that lecture and then later on we can talk about it and swap what uh information we got from these lectures um and, and the nice thing about exotics con i would say is because the exotic practitioner community is a little bit smaller um, than the dog and cat community you know certainly there are less people who are seeing birds and reptiles and other small mammals um it's a smaller community a little more tight-knit community than like the dog cat community for for veterinary medicine and so a lot of us kind of know each other um so it's also a time to get to see your friends that you haven't seen for a year um and and um you know it's easy to be able to say okay you go to that lecture i go to that go to that lecture and later on we'll talk about it and see what what each other learned um now a lot of times the first 
day of the conference before you go to all those lectures a lot of times the very first day they will have what's called wet labs and so i have a picture here of one of the labs that was set up and this i believe was actually a wet lab for um i think small mammals i didn't i didn't do this particular wet lab there's lots of wet labs that are happening um at the same time, again, this is usually the first day, so it's like morning time to evening time that you have these wet labs going on. And they're called wet labs because it usually means that you're you're interacting with something. Um, and a lot of times there are animals, it depends on the, the particular lab that you're doing, but there may be animals that are used um, during these these things. And so like this one, this is an ultrasound lab. And to have an ultrasound lab, you know, you really need to have an animal that you are ultrasounding to learn from because, you know, you can't really put the ultrasound on a stuffed animal. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you might get an idea of the movements and locations of where you're supposed to put the probe, but you really need a live animal to see um, structures and, and get used to actually using this equipment. And the nice thing is, is that a lot of times um, the conference will pair with maybe like a local university or maybe a local rescue um, to where we are able to have those animals come in um, and participate in in the labs um, and help help us all learn. Um, and it's really important that that you do these sort of things because some of these technologies, um, you don't always necessarily learn everything in vet school. I mean, there's so much to know that there's no way you could learn everything. And so where some schools may have a lot of information for veterinary students on, on ultrasounds and some veterinary students may come out of a school having done a lot of ultrasounds, some other students may not. Um, and so the ability to um, do these ultrasounds and do these wet labs. Hold on a second, Arroyo's getting into trouble. He's getting into, nope. Oh no. We have this little trick or treat bin and uh, he got some Twizzlers, so no. No Twizzlers for Maurice. Step up. <laughs> All right, go over there. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, anyways, so so it's really important that these wet labs are, are done so people can learn and can expand upon their knowledge because, you know, we want to be able to help the animals that are coming in to, to see us and you have to you have to learn somewhere and you have to keep up with that knowledge. So even if you've done ultrasounds in veterinary school, um, it's still great to do them at these labs because you're gonna learn new techniques and new things from people who are doing this more than you. Because most of these labs are taught by people, well, all these labs are really taught by people who are doing these things much more than the people they're teaching it to. Um, so this is just an example of the ultrasound wet lab that was set up. The wet lab that I chose to do was a CE wet lab. So um, this was in one of the conference rooms. Um, I know you guys have had Dr. Scott Eccles talk with you guys before. This is Dr. Eccles right here. Um, Dr. Eccles, I believe when he talked to you guys before, he uh, talked with you guys about CT scanning and all the new information that is coming out um, and all the great research that he and others are doing um, that's helping us learn a whole lot more about birds and other exotic pets. And so I took this lab because um, it's something that I need to learn more about and I need to, to get better about with CTs. Um, you know, our practice doesn't have one currently, but we're hopefully going to be getting one in the near future. Um, a lot of practices are starting to get this sort of technology. And so with new technology, you got to get new education. Um, CTs is not something that I learned in veterinary school. I learned x-rays, I learned ultrasound, but CT imaging, MRI imaging, I was around the practitioners, the, the, um, my teachers, you know, um, while some of these things were happening, but they didn't really teach us much about it because I graduated um, 11 years ago. And at that time, it was like, you know, most people aren't going to be having a CT in their office. So it wasn't something that we really focused on at all. And I mean, now 11 years later, um, it's becoming more and more a common thing for people to have in their veterinary practice. And and exotics in particular are really starting to use it a lot because it's helping us find really teeny tiny little microscopic things that may have been difficult to find before with your traditional x-rays. Um, and so 
you know, new technologies out, I got to learn how to, to use it so that I can use this technology to help my patients. Because right now I have to refer to other hospitals that have CTs to, to get this done. And, and hopefully soon I will also be able to have this technology in my practice to be able to, um, you know, help my patients further. Um, and so, you know, I want to learn from, from the best and, and Dr. Scott Eccles really is quite amazing um, with everything that he has been teaching people with CTs. Um, and so let's go to the next slide here. Uh, just a couple of images. This was, I was actually sitting at my computer screen. So here's my little computer screen that they had set up for me um, on that wet lab day that I, they already had a bunch of images that were previously done on animals um, that they were using for the lab. So we didn't have any live animals for this because all of these were examples of patients that have previously um, been seen. And so we were uh, manipulating the software, inter interchanging with the, the um, different images, playing around with everything to really figure out how to use the software and figure out how to read things. Um, and you're, when you're looking at these images, what we're seeing here, this one down in the left-hand corner, um, we're just manipulating, looking at the spine of this animal. In this image up here, this is actually a bird. Um, up in the right side screen here. And what it's doing is it's showing sort of three different planes of this animal, um, a transverse view, a sagittal view, a dorsal ventral view. And so it's taking this, this animal um, that's you know in three dimensions and we're like slicing it in different ways to actually get um, a picture of what's going on internally. And so in this image, you can actually see there's some lungs uh, right here and the hearts right up there bones. Um, so, and you can kind of see it down here too. That's the, the heart. So it's just, a um, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot how to do uh, these CT scans. Um, and then I have one more image here. This is actually a macaw. Um, and it is sort of a head on view of the macaw. So here's its eyes on either side. And um, what this bright white thing is here on both sides. That's actually the bone that's in bird's eyes. So, and I, I should have probably gone over it on one of the previous um, like physical exam or um, things. I don't think I did, but birds actually have bone in their eye. And so it's really cool because on these CT images, you can actually see this is the eye and there's the bone. It's called scleral ossicles that are present in a bird's eye. And so, you know, it, th those are hard to actually see on an x-ray. Um, and so with CT scans, you get so much more detailed information. You can blow it up, you can manipulate the image, and you can see these scleral ossicles really easily, along with tons of other things. This is the trachea down here. Here's all the rings on the trachea um, for, for the bird. Um, this is a part, part of its tongue. This is a part of the hyoid apparatus. So there's a structure like a little bone at the back that helps them move their tongue. So just really fascinating um, stuff that gives us lots of detail. Now on an x-ray, I can see some of these things. It's just that the detail's not as, as good. Um, and, and it's wonderful that we have this great new technology to really be helping us because if a bird came in and say it got, um, was hit a window or something like that. Let's say this, this bird flew into a window and I want to see if its head was injured in any way. Well, an x-ray can help me, um, but a CT scan gives me a whole lot more information. An x-ray, I might not be able to see something like a little fracture of one of the scleral ossicles, but I could see that on a CT scan. Um, so it's really, really cool stuff. Um, so this was my first day at ExoticsCon after registering and everything. Um, I was able to do my my wet lab. This is what I chose to do. I only chose to do one. There's sometimes where I'll do a couple, um, but this year I just chose to do one wet lab and it was the CT one. Um, so the other thing that was happening um, on that first day is, is just kind of, you know, checking into your rooms, getting everything settled. Um, and then the next day um, when the, the conference really started, that's kind of like when, you know, everything's really starting to get pretty, pretty busy. So um, now in the, in the conference, when you're having the conference going on, you know, again, there's all these lectures. So there's multiple lectures going on and they're literally starting at like, I don't know, eight or nine o'clock in the morning. It does vary from one day to the next. They may have like a breakfast or something um, early scheduled in for people. Um, 
but they'll sometimes go until like seven o'clock at night. So it's kind of like being back in vet school where you are just like busy all day long and you know, you get little breaks here and there, but not a ton of breaks. Um, and when you're at conferences in between the, um, lectures and everything, your breaks usually involve you going to the exhibit hall. So here's just a picture of the exhibit hall. This is actually the Lefebvre's booth um, in the exhibit hall, just an example of one of the booths. Um, but you can see kind of behind this little curtain here, there's actually an other booth on the other side. On the other side of the Lefebvre's booth here, there's an other booth on the other side. Um, and so the, the exhibit halls are a lot of fun too, because it's kind of where you do your shopping. Um, and there's lots of different people who are there displaying their products. So Lefebvre's is there displaying their products. Um, and what you can see in the Lefebvre's booth here is there's just um, like some information about dietary stuff. And they do actually have a lot of their uh, products that were up on the wall. Now the products that they're mostly displaying were are more the um, veterinary products because again, it's a veterinary conference. So the um, veterinary products are gonna be the most uh, interesting to the vets that that are there. Um, but then we also, you know, you can see off to the side here, there's some of the, like the nutri berries and um, the new um, gourmet pellets and everything. Um, so, and a lot of the other booths are, are very similar, it just depends on what products they have. There's book booths, which are always a lot of fun. I think a lot of people like going to the book booths because again, at the, the booths that have books, you're just getting more information and more knowledge. Um, but there's, booths that were like for CTs, there were booths for instruments, so like surgical instruments, there were booths for um, loops, so like which are these little uh, things that people will wear on their in their glasses or their their light glasses that allow you to see a little closer. Um, and so with working with exotics, we're working with these teeny tiny little animals. And so if you're working with a canary and you're looking for like a little string that might be wrapped around its leg, sometimes that can be a little hard to see. Um, so there's like surgical eye loops that are used or that people booths will be selling and you can like try them on and kind of see what works for you. The people will fit you. Um, there's ultrasound booths. I mean, there's so many different booths that are, are selling products um, that veterinarians need to purchase in order to effectively work on their patients. Um, there were other other food companies as well that were having booths. Um, and then even rescues will have booths as well. And it's, it's kind of neat because every year when you go to these different conferences, there'll be like a, a rescue that has a booth from wherever you are. Um, so you get to kind of see different rescues, different years, and get a little bit of exposure to who's out there doing what, helping what animals. So. Uh, here's just a different angle um, of the, the booth here. There's often a little bit of free product too that people will have um, so that they can, you know, uh, sort of display their new stuff and allow people to, to see if they actually like the product um, and want to potentially use it more. Um, and just one more angle. But Lefebvre's has a very, had a very nice booth. All right, now the other thing that's fun, I mentioned that you get to um, see your friends uh, right. throughout the years, because again, the veterinary exotics community, the veterinary community is small to begin with, but the exotics community is even much smaller um, and more tight knit. So a lot of us know each other. Um, so here's here's Nina, uh, she's working the Lefebvre's booth there. Um, and this is Dr. Tom Tully, which, I think, is he talking for you guys next week? Um, he'll be uh, the 28th of October, I think. Right? Okay. Um, but I know, you know, he's doing lots of talks for you guys and everything. So there he is right there. Um, just being a part of the, the conference and everything. Other people. Um, here's, here's Dr. Ted Lefebvre himself, uh, Jr. <laughs> um, oh, there's there's me at the, the booth as well. And you can see, you know, people are just mingling around, coming up, um, trying to uh, learn about different products, but also just a time to, to reconnect with people. Um, oh, this is Dr. Uh, Jorg Meyer. So I know he spoke for you guys last week. Um, so there he is as well, hanging out at the conference. Uh, so I think a lot of the people who have spoken for you guys, you're going to see throughout these 
these photos because um, I mean, this is the real deal. These are the, the people who are involved with medical care, veterinary care for birds and other exotics. Um, so just a few more photos of us at the booth there. Um, oh, we were also, the Lefebvre's booth was doing a, a giveaway too. Um, so that's what's kind of fun too with the exhibit halls. Everybody loves to go to the exhibit halls because um, again, you're, you're seeing all the different products that are out there. You get into hold the products, see if you like the products. Um, but then also some little, some different booths will like give away like a little gift, you know, like kind of how you guys do the, um, uh, yeah, the product giveaway at the end of these webinars. Um, that was sort of similar to what was happening at the Lefebvre booth for the veterinarians this year. Um, people who were coming up were uh, able to like get into a little raffle um, for like a prize at the end, so. So Dr. Lamb, do, do people, um, had, had anyone actually tried the, like the Nutribray samples? Because they're human grade, aren't they? Yes, <laughs> actually, oh, let me go back. Oh, okay, so here on this table here, you can see that actually the product is out on the, the table so people can play with it and hold it. Um, because it's one thing looking at it in a bag, but actually getting in your hand and manipulating it and being like, how's my, my patient gonna really interact with this? Is this is my patient gonna like this? Is this the appropriate consistency that they can crunch on it well, or is this not right? Um, so what's nice is, Lefebvre's does put their product out and a lot of other like the food companies will put their their product out so people can see it um but what's funny is people do actually try the Nutriberries so like there's some Nutriberries sitting right there and this cute little rat stuffed animal is actually sitting over um the the um rat Nutriberries um uh, and so uh people will definitely try these things and it's, it's kind of funny <laughs> although this year um I will say that we were just letting people know because you'll notice most of the people that are in here have masks on again we're still in COVID times right so yeah. we're all trying to be as um clean and safe as possible um so I don't know maybe if this would have been a different year maybe more people would have tried I don't I, I saw people I saw a couple people try but not a ton so you know probably COVID safety <laughs> because these things do get touched right and we don't want to like yeah them. so yeah um this photo here this is actually one of my mentors um and it's just fun because i haven't seen her for several years and she was involved in my residency dr ann burke um and so it was nice to to get to see her and and chat you know we live on different ends of the country i'm in arizona uh, she's out in connecticut you know so um you know we're really all coming together to to talk about birds, you know, and it was funny because when this photo was taken, I think we were like even talking about a patient that she had a little budgie that she was telling me about that she was like, oh, you know, when I go to conference, I'm going to ask people about this because, you know, there are difficult cases for sure that are out there. I think a lot of times um, people expect the veterinarian to always have an answer, but the reality is we don't always have an answer. There's a lot of things that we don't know. Um, there's a lot of things we do know, and we learn from going to these conferences for sure, and we know more every year, but there's so many questions that we still have. And there's some cases that are very, very difficult cases that you, you, you really sometimes, you know, you need a second opinion or you need to talk with somebody else about it, or you need to bounce it off somebody else's head. And sometimes even when you do that, you find out that nobody else knows either. Um, but you know, you a lot of times when you do those things, you still come up with little ideas of, well, maybe I don't know exactly what's going on with your patient, but what about this? Or could you try this? Or what do you think about this um, potential option? You know, and and it's pretty amazing sometimes the things that come out of those little conversations, where it may just seem like some teeny little conversation that's not a not likely to result in much. And, and then next year you go to conference and you find out that there was some huge success and now they're like talking about it at conference, you know? Okay. So um, it's really, really valuable to go to these conferences because that communication between veterinarians is just so, so important. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, okay. So other things that were going on. So um, talking about the, the um, wet labs, talking about the exhibit hall, and the exhibit hall is open for several days, um, so it's nice because you don't always have to 
go just all at the same time, like you can kind of filter in and out of there as you like. Um, but one of the other things that was happening was this, this poster contest. And this year I had a lot more stuff that I was a part of than I have been in the past. Um, I am on the AAV, so the um, Association of Avian Veterinarians uh, Education Committee. Um, and it's just in sort of like extracurricular veterinary stuff to do. Uh, oftentimes all veterinarians are involved with some sort of uh, organization that they're a member of, but not everybody is like in the um, like part of the, the like management of that um, of that veterinary group. Um, and, and different veterinary groups are always at, trying to get, you know, different people involved in like sort of the management sort of things and on different committees, because that's what really makes those um, different veterinary groups run and function. And so for, for me, I'm on the education committee for the Association um, of Avian Debts. And so I was asked to rate posters this year. So when you submit stuff to be a like part of a conference, you can either submit to talk, do a wet lab, or you can submit stuff to do posters because not everybody likes to talk, right? Not everybody's really excited about standing up in front of a room full of people um, and talking about things. That can be kind of nerve wracking sometimes. Um, so what's nice is you can also do posters where you present your research in that form instead. And so it's kind of like for the shy people. I mean, it's good it's for everybody, but for it's nice for people who are shy, um, who don't want to stand up in front of a room, but still want to like tell people about something really interesting that they have done. Um, so this is just an example of one of the posters uh, on penguins. Um, here's another one. This was actually the one that won. Um, this year, again, COVID made it so that things were a little bit different this year. Thankfully, we were at least able to do the conference, which was really great. Um, it, do the conference in person, I should say, because we were able to do it last year with COVID, but we weren't able to do it in person. It was all online. This year, thankfully, we were um, uh, in person, but it, it did make it a little bit different in that there weren't as many people who were submitting posters. In previous years, you'll walk around the poster area and there's like, I don't know, probably like 60 different posters. Uh, it seems like there's quite a bit versus this year, there was like six. Um, so there weren't a ton of posters, but they are really interesting to read. Um, this one was on uh, research that was done in zebra finches regarding um, a particular medication that's used all the time in veterinary medicine called midazolam. And they were just checking to see like, is it better to give it orally? Is it better to give by an injection? How does it affect the bird as well? Which is all really important information to know. And how does it affect the zebra finch specifically? Because, you know, we may have this information for like the cockatiel, but Cockatiel is really different from the zebra finch. You know, cockatiel is a cytosine. The zebra finch is a passerine. Two totally different branches of birds. And you really need information specific to the species to really know what is, you know, how something's working in an individual species. And so, yes, this particular type of research has been done before in other species, but this is like new for the zebra finch. And so, you know, there, there's unique little things that pop out. Sometimes you'll find that, okay, maybe a cockatiel is very similar to a budgie or, you know, what have you with its dosing, but then you compare it to a zebra finch and the dosing is totally different, you know? So unique things like that pop up and it's really important that we know that stuff so we can accurately treat our patients most most effectively. Um, all right, let me go to the next. Okay, these are just some pictures of the actual um, lectures themselves. Uh, there's Dr. Tully again. Uh, so when people are giving lectures, they also have to have um, their colleagues introduce them. Um, and so the people who are on the different committees are often asked to introduce other veterinarians. And so here's Dr. Tom Tully, um, who was being part of introducing um, the speaker, Dr. Pilney. Dr. Pilney is actually one of the veterinarians that works at the hospital where I am. Um, here's what the conference hall looked like. I mean, you can see they can get pretty packed um, with, with people. Um, and this is just one of the, this is just one of the talks. And again, like I said, there's multiple talks going on. So this particular day, there were three different sessions, three different concurrent sessions that were going on. 
Um, and just you can see how packed this one session is. Um, and there's Dr. Pilney talking there. Um, and you know, there's lots and lots of different things that are discussed. So as you saw with the poster, there was information being discussed about the a particular drug. Um, Dr. Pilney here was talking about assessing avian welfare, which is really important. So, and this is this is extremely important information to, to know about um, because yeah, we need to know how to treat our patients appropriately. We need to know how to diagnose, to treat patients, but we also have to understand the, the behavioral side of things. And we have to make sure that what we're doing is ethically like right for, for animals. Um, and then we're also advising pet owners how to be ethical and do right things and do right by their animal. Um, because yeah, anybody can have a pet bird, but you know, we wanna keep our pets happy and healthy and making sure that they have good welfare and owners know how to provide good welfare is extremely important. And so we're talking about that sort of stuff too. Um, just everybody paying close attention to, to Dr. Pilney's talk there. Um, so they also were introducing this year that they were doing a virtual talk to a, a virtual conference as well. Um, and this is Dr. Dr. Zender, Ashley Zender. She's actually the outgoing president for the Association of Avian Vets. Um, so she was like totally busy the, the whole time that she was there. You know, she's uh, helping like with coordinating this whole conference. Again, this conference was several days long, has to be coordinated with other groups, you know, not just the avian group, it has to be coordinated with the reptile amphibian and the small mammal group. Um, and there's a whole bunch of little pieces that need to be figured out and um, the presidents, past presidents, things like that in the associations are really key players in getting these things to run well. <laughs> um, uh, just another example of a of a lecture. Um, this one was about some new technology. Um, so there's some new technology of how we analyze blood in birds and reptiles. So interestingly, one of the tests that we do very frequently is called a CBC. It's a complete blood count. And we talked about that um, in previous lectures that I've done with you guys. Very, very, very common test. What it's doing is it's looking at white cells, it's looking at red cells, it's looking at um, thrombocytes, which are the bird and reptile version of platelets. Um, and on the dog and cat and like mammal side of things, for years, they have had the ability to put like a drop of blood into a machine and the machine analyzes it and tells you the amount of red blood cells, the amount of white blood cells, and the different percentages of those individual white blood cells. We haven't had that available to birds and reptiles um, until now. And the reason we haven't had that available is because mammal red blood cells look vastly different than mammal white blood cells. Mammal red blood cells don't have a nucleus. And just a like quick biology, um, lesson is that you have a cell and in the cell there's a nucleus um, and then that nucleus is important for doing lots of activities or, or governing activities that are going on within a cell. Now interestingly when red blood cells are developing and maturing they lose their nucleus in mammals. That doesn't happen in birds and reptiles and amphibians. They maintain their nucleus and so when you're looking at a microscope slide and you're looking at a blood smear, looking at a mammal blood smear looks vastly different than looking at a bird or reptile blood smear. And um, frankly, a mammal blood smear is so much easier to read and evaluate than a bird or reptile. And so all your bird and reptile um, blood has to be analyzed uh, by a person looking at it and reading that. Whereas mammals, it can go through an automated analyzer. Now, um, technology has been developed and it's literally like brand new technology um, that people are just starting to use and was really kind of um, highlighted at this conference um, where they have made um, a computer uh, processor that actually is able to distinguish red blood cells versus white blood cells in bird and um, reptile amphibian blood. 
and it's able to tell the different types of white blood cells. So this is amazing for the avian and exotic practitioner um, because it really, really is going to help speed up the ability for us to get our test results back. Because when you're relying on a person to sit there and like read this test, it takes time. It takes time to read those things. Um, and it's so much easier to put it into a machine and it pops out your answers in like five minutes. Um, so this is going to really help speed things up. And it's amazing that we now have this. It's, it's still new. So a lot of people are a little bit nervous about it, but um, there's a lot of stuff that the company sort of presented on to be like, okay, look, this is, um, we have done a lot of research on this um, and here's why we think our product is really good. And we've compared it to, you know, people reading samples and we'll even like, you know, give you pictures of what things look like. And if you're concerned about anything, you know, if you send us your samples, then, you know, we're going to um, follow up and, and, and make sure that the technology is working appropriately and what have you. So fun, new information. <laughs> Uh, just another example of an individual talking, this is Dr. Uh, Seth Oster. He was given a uh, talk on radiographs and reading radiographs and birds. And I apologize, the picture is a little bit fuzzy. Um, it was in a dark room. I don't have the greatest camera and it came out quite fuzzy in this image. But I put this picture up because I wanted to show that there's also basic stuff that's happening at these conferences too. So we're doing a lot of new advanced stuff, um, new technologies, evaluating new treatments, all that sort of stuff, but we're also providing information to new veterinarians. That's more basic, you know? So you, you know, again, as we've talked about before in vet school, you don't always learn a ton about exotics and birds. Um, and so if you really wanna work on a bird, a reptile, a rabbit, you have to go the extra mile and, and get that additional education elsewhere. And so the conference is, is providing that information to new veterinarians as well. And this is, was kind of a basic radiology lecture that's extremely important for any new veterinarian to be able to understand. But also veterinarians who've been doing stuff for a long time, it's good to go to these lectures too, because sometimes, you know, maybe you kind of forgot about something and this is a great way to remind you of like oh yeah i totally forgot about that particular like you know thing that they're talking about right now i'm so glad i went to this um and then i put this picture up these are a, a couple of uh, other you know avian veterinarians that are out there uh dr lauren powers dr glenn olson um I'm not i think this individual I apologize, I don't remember who this was, but this is someone I think at LSU. Um, people working in different parts of the country, getting together and just sitting there and talking. And again, like I mentioned earlier, this is so important to do because it really helps ideas and the generation of ideas. Um, I work with Dr. Glenn Olson usually about once a year. Um, we work on a project with some uh, quail. There are an endangered, there's an endangered species of quail that is in Arizona. Um, and we work on a project together with them once a year where we're doing vasectomies. Um, and Dr. Olson is, has been doing wildlife um, work and, and sort of wildlife conservation work for many, many, many years and has a ton of knowledge and experience. And so it's great that, you know, I get to collaborate with him that, you know, I'm normally I'm working at, um, you know, my, the hospital where I work, Arizona God again Hospital, but I also get to do these fun things uh, here and there outside of like regular uh, pet care. Um, and, you know, he's one of the individuals who is helpful with a, another project that I get to work with. Um, and so, you know, going to these conferences, talking to people, exchanging ideas, extremely important. Um, again, just a few more lecture hall stuff, because again, this is this really is the majority of what is happening um, is people are learning. Here's a little Quaker parrot um, on the screen here that uh, this doctor was presenting about. She was presenting about foreign bodies, birds eating things that they're not supposed to, um, and how to manage and deal with those particular problems. Uh, I put this up because this is actually one of my previous interns, Dr. Elizabeth Hyde. She's up in Washington State now. And um, when she was in her internship at our hospital, she did a project uh, in Arizona. We actually have the rosy-faced lovebirds as a wild population out here. Um, and she did a project with them on individuals that were coming into a 
wildlife rehabilitation facility. Um, and so she finally got to present it because last year she wasn't able to because COVID happened and like her talk had, though it had been accepted, it had to get scrubbed um, just because a lot of talks had to last year. So she was able to do it this year. And so it was fun to get to see her present, um, you know, through our internship program, she got to do this little research project and present it to the country. Um, so that was awesome. Uh, this was just, I got a little award on one of the nights. So a lot of times they, you have your lectures throughout the day, you're going to your exhibit halls, um, and then usually in the evening times, and again, some of these lectures are going on till like 7 p.m., um, but usually in the evening times they try to have some get together if possible you know there's there again there's all these different conferences or not conferences me um committees on the conference um and again i'm in the education committee and so i had done some work throughout the year uh, and i got some little outstanding service awards so that was kind of cool um that i got a little award from uh the, the president there of the association um but so they have little fun things like that too and they're, they give like, well, there's the, the um, LeFevre's award that is given out every year um, that you guys give. That's the, the cast hands of um, Dr. Ted LeFevre Sr. Um, holding a little budgie. And that's given to somebody who is um, sort of just outstanding in, in veterinary medicine. They're, you know, a great clinician for birds. Um, they're, you know, dedicated to, uh, educating people, good customer service, you know, advancing um, the knowledge base, all that sort of stuff. You know, they have to fit all these criteria uh, to be considered and somebody gets selected from that. The um, Small Mammal Group has one as well, the Oxbow Award. And then um, the Reptile Amphibian Group also has one as well that's been going on for a couple of years. So those are those are kind of fun. People get to be recognized by their colleagues, um, which is, you know, a, a nice thing. Everybody kind of, kind of, likes that sort of stuff. Um, this was me talking. Uh, I did give one short talk. I've only ever done a little like 15 minute talks. I don't tend to have um, big longer talks or anything like that. But this was, I was presenting on a case that I had. Uh, this particular bird was a great little bird that I worked with for several years. I had a, a chronic problem. Um, and I felt that he was a good case to present to my colleagues because he, there were some interesting things with him on his blood work and his x-rays and the treatments that we did with him and sort of the follow-up that, that he had. He was, uh, had some very fabulous owners, extremely nice people who uh, allowed him to have a lot of good um, follow-up care. And that good follow-up care allowed us to track this bird's problem and be able to help this bird for many years with the particular problem that he had. And he did ultimately pass away. He was, I think, 29 when he passed away. So, you know, he's an older cockatiel, which is great to, to make it to about 29. Um, and after he passed, I thought, you know, he, he had a lot of interesting things about his case that I think I should present to other people about because I think other people can learn from this. And so, I mean, when I, I told the owners, I asked them if they could, if they could potentially send me photos because I wanted to present and they were really excited that, you know, people were going to learn from, from him. Um, and I, I feel like most of the time where I have written a paper or presented on a particular patient's problem and, and, you know, and own, you know, had an owner um, behind that particular patient that I was working with and, and told them, you know, hey, I'd, I'd really like to um, present your, your pet's information to other veterinarians. Everybody, you know, the owners are always like, oh, this is great. We'd love to have our, our pet be a part of um, learning for other people because I, th I think most people understand having pet birds um, or other exotics that there is a lot that we don't know and there is still so much more we need to learn. And if, we do something that really helps a particular individual. If we can show that to other veterinarians, then that's probably going to go on to help other individuals. And who knows, it could potentially spark future research to help other problems. You know, we may identify one little problem within this bigger problem, and maybe there's some research that's been done to 
fix that one little problem to maybe help the bigger problem in the end. And you know, this particular this particular talk that I did this year, um, I was pretty happy with at the end of it in that there was a bit of discussion at the end because there were a couple of things along the way that were unknowns. And um, at the end, usually you're in like 15 minutes to talk and then there's like a five minute um, question answer sort of thing or time for people to move from one room to the next because again, when there's the 15 minute talks, there's a lot of people talking. Sometimes you'll have like six concurrent sessions going on at the same time. And so people are running from one room to the next, trying to get to their next um, talk, but they give time for people to discuss and ask questions. And I felt like when I was done with my talk, I, I got a lot of questions from my colleagues and that's what I wanted. You know, that was what I really wanted out of this particular talk that I gave was to, to get other people thinking and, and saying, well, like, why did you do that? And well, I, you know, I had one person who told me that they had an extremely similar case and there was something that I did with my case that they hadn't thought of. And they thought, you know, if they were to have this problem happen again, that they would use some of what they knew with their case, but then also what I was able to present and use that in the future, you know, so um, a really great way to hopefully help other animals um, in the future, you know. So even if, you know, for me, like I'm, I'm working in a small private practice um, with pets. I'm not at a university like Dr. Uh, Jörg Meyer. Um, and, you know, I'm not really involved in typical like bigger research projects or anything like that. Um, I, I have a couple of tiny little research things that I've done, but extremely minimal compared to some other individuals that are out there. Um, and it's nice to be able to present in this way because it's, you know, one way that I, as a practitioner, can can help other veterinarians and, and thus ultimately other birds and other animals in the future, hopefully. So that's, that's the end goal really of all of this is that we're able to help um, help our animals uh, live better lives in, in the end with all this. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, so th that was all the photos that I had and everything from, from the event. Um, I guess the other thing I would say that happens during these conferences that I didn't have any photos of is we also have like committee meetings too. So like the different committees, um, cause again, so with the Association of Avian Vets, there's the education committee that I'm on, but there's plenty of other committees too. There's like the welfare committee, and then there's the conservation committee, and then there is the aviculture committee. Um, there's several different ones. And so sometimes people are members of, of multiple different committees. And so those committees have to get together as well and meet because, you know, we'll do stuff online throughout the year where we're organizing different things, but getting together once a year to sit down and discuss things and get, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, conversations with others who are in the, the committees is important to do as well. Um, so yeah, so that was that was my time at Exotics Con and this sort of thing, you know, this is the exotic side of things, but this sort of thing happens with dogs and cats, horses, cattle, zoo, I mean, any any veterinary field, um, you know, even the individual little specialties like dermatology or ophthalmology or what have you. Um, these, these conferences are extremely important and, and all veterinarians go to them. Um, not all states, but most states in the US require a veterinarian to have um, a certain amount of continuing education credits every year. And when we go to these conferences, this is one of the ways that we gain continuing education credits. And you have to like submit it to the veterinary board for the state that you're in so that you're proving that, yeah, I am going to these things. I am staying on top of my education. I am continuing to learn because it's extremely important. When you become a veterinarian, you are never going to stop learning. If you do, then you need to stop being a veterinarian um, because there's just so much to learn. Um, and this is how we get at least a good portion of that learning done. So, uh, That's right. that reminds me of my dad, my dad used to say that, um, that once you become an ex, you don't want to ever become an expert because then you become an ex learner. If you think you're the expert, you don't learn as you, you stop your learning. So exactly that's totally true <laughs> so there's always something to learn you'll never you'll never you know become the most most knowledgeable about something about something because there's always somebody else who's going to be more knowledgeable about this little part of it or that little part of it or whatever and it, it's you all got to come together and and uh, get your minds together to 
to do the, the best for your patient in the long run. Yes, and Dr. Lamb, just real quick. Um, they're also the TJ uh, Lefebvre Practitioner of the Year Award. Is that also that's, given that's, out at the? Yes, that's given out every year. That's the one that I was talking about. That that's Dr. Uh, Ted Lefebvre Senior. The hands, Senior. right, with the budgie. Yeah, yeah, with the little budgie inside of it. Yeah. So that's nice. That's given out every year, and and usually, so like the different um, the different groups who give out those types of awards, uh, will give them out at different times. So some of them will do it during a um, like a little ceremony. Um, some will make it a little lower key where it's just kind of given between the conference lectures. Um, some will do it like the first day because usually the first day of the actual, of the conference sessions, not the, not the um, wet labs because the wet labs often are the first day. Um, and then the second day is like the actual, like this is the conference starting and they get everybody together. And, and usually there's a keynote speaker that they bring in. So every, all the people who are coming are hearing the first same speaker. Um, so some people will do it on, on that day. Okay. And, um, and someone had, you mentioned uh, early on about um, uh, Dr. Scott Eccles uh, CT scan lecture. Um, we actually did a webinar on with Dr. Eccles on that. So um, anyone, if you uh, if you guys want to check out the Lefebvre YouTube channel, you'll find that webinar on there. It's a fascinating, fascinating webinar that he gave. Um, and uh, I think someone had asked if that would be a um, if they'd be publishing or papers been published regarding the CT compared to X-rays. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely papers that have been published on different aspects of CT, and I know Dr. Eccles is doing like so much research that um, there's tons of new papers that are coming out all the time, and on so many different aspects too. Um, so you know, one of the papers that uh, is going to be hopefully coming out that he was saying is about like the contrast meaning, because sometimes you need to, and well, you should for a lot of CTs be giving contrast that is given as an intravascular thing and it just moves through the body and then it gets excreted rather quickly and it actually helps enhance imaging um, and your ability to see certain things. And so I know he's working on that, having that published and a couple of the talks. So I went to the lab that was about how to use the machines and how to manipulate the images and everything. But then a couple of the talks were from one of his uh, residents who has like a bunch of uh, case studies that he's done and, and how he's used the CT scan to find these weird things and how it helped guide him to do certain surgeries or what have you. Okay. Wow. That was a fascinating look. Uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to next year's um, exotics con. So it's like, a, it's always a great event. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to do, so next Friday, we're on with Dr. Uh, Susan Oris and uh, Dollhousing to go over the uh, avian borna virus part two. So um, I think on that one, we have some, um, they'll answer some of the, the, the pre-sent questions from, um, from bird owners. So uh, you want to log, uh, tune in next Friday for avian uh, boner bias part two. And then um, Dr. Tolley is on with us again. We mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Tolley is our uh, regular Ask the Vet um, uh, webinar host, um, and he'll be on October 29th. So that's, that's the Friday, the 29th. Um, so, okay, I have a fun, I, I am so excited to play this. Okay, so our giveaway for today, our product giveaway from the Fever is going to be the uh, popcorn Nutriberries. And the winner, that's gonna go out to Audrey. Audrey O'Connor, congratulations. Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna play this really cute video. Hopefully, I, I hopefully it shares properly because I love this video so much. Uh, Dr. Lamb, uh, we're gonna go out on this video. Uh, thank you so much for, for giving us a behind the scenes look at Exoxcom. Uh, that's a, that's a very- that's a very fascinating look and, and it just shows you how much your um you know our avian vets they, they care so much about their your birds their birds they're so passionate about the subject and that's why this is such a, a great event so yes all right here we go i'm going to share the screen i hope this works proper this is going to be awesome um okay okay here we go hopefully okay This is the popcorn nutriberry is our product of the month. Royal, you can't have any of this popcorn. This is human food. Royal, don't you know that this popcorn with all of its fake butter and everything and oils on it is full of trans fats and hydrogenated oils? You can't have anything like this. This isn't good for a bird. Oh, no, you want it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love it. I love it so much. Oh my goodness. That is awesome. Um, <laughs> a good, a good acting chops by both you and Arroyo. Thank you so much for that. That was brilliant. I love it. All right. That's the product of the month and um, everyone until next Friday, everyone be safe. Have a great week and all the best to you and your flock. Bye. Bye.